Well, I'm going to go through uh, the key passages. Because this book is so hard to outline, so I'm going to give you the rest of the book from uh, 19 to 52, okay, real quickly, and you have some uh, little parts to fill in. And, and what I decided to do for you is just to give the verses that are, are the life changers, the ringers. Now, for some of you that have read this book many times, you've got other ringers than I have. But if you've never read this book, then you ought to follow along and maybe mark some of these and let them be a great blessing in your life. Number one, Jeremiah 1.5 tells us that God is sovereign in his election. Uh, election means his picking, his choosing. And God does that according to his will. And we can understand that because we're so human and so selfish. This is what it says in verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God forms people in the womb. Did you know that conception is of the Lord? Did you know there's not one baby on any corner of any continent that starts its little existence into this world that God is not a part of that? That means there are no accidents. Uh, I always will remember my good friend that I went to seminary with that said to me, uh, he said, I was an accident after a football game. And I looked at him and I said, what? He says, yeah. I said, my dad, one of the cheerleaders, I was an accident. I said, and you know, he really, he was kind of one of those people that walked around like this, you know. Felt like he was a nothing. And I said, you were no accident. God says, I formed you in the womb, and I knew you. And I don't think that was just Jeremiah. Jeremiah was chosen to be a prophet in the womb, but God knows all. Because conception is of the Lord, the scriptures tell us. I consecrated you before you were born. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What that tells me is that I am not only not a protoplasmic blob with no purpose that just accidentally came, but that God has crafted and designed and fitted each one of us for something that only we can do. I'm kind of excited to do what he wants me to do. And I don't want to do what you're supposed to do. And you shouldn't want to do what I'm supposed to do. We should all do what God has called us to do. And there should be great confidence in that. There should be great joy in that. There should be an expectancy every morning as you start out. Quicker than you grab the morning paper to see who we've bombed today. You ought to pick up the Bible and say, God, what do you want me to do for you today? Secondly, God is serious about his word. Verse 12 of chapter 1, if you're following along, it says this, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. God says, I am vitally interested in making happen what I have promised. And if I have said that there will be great peace to those that love my law, if you love my law, I'm going to give you great peace. If I have said that there's no temptation that will take you, but I won't give an exit door, I'll give the exit door. See, God's watching over his word. He's very serious about his word. Thirdly, God is settled against the self-sufficient life. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is the condemnation of the self-sufficient life. Now, I wish I had time to go through this, but I'll tell you real quickly. In the Middle East, it's very dry. It rains during the rainy season, so people would build water collection devices that would collect water from the top of their houses and their courtyards and go down into cisterns. And whenever you go around Old Jerusalem or any other place, you, you're always seeing these old cisterns. They've excavated them. You walk through them and you look up, and it's totally plastered. There's a little hole in the ceiling, and they would hold just incredible vast amounts of water. But there are three times a cistern would run out. One is if you took too much water out of it, if you drew it all out. Secondly, if it got hot for an extended period of time, it evaporates. And finally, which was very frequent, there were earthquakes, and the earthquakes would break the walls of the cistern and the water would drain out. A cistern goes dry when it's overused. So in the Christian life, when the demands increase, we go dry. And if we go dry, it's because we're operating our own strength. Have you ever said, oh, I'm just giving so much and giving so much to so many people, I'm just getting dry spiritually? Do you know what that means? You're operating on your own batteries. The Lord said, these people forsook the fountain to have their own cisterns. When you and I are making it on our own, we go dry spiritually. That's why you can meet some people and you can do anything to them. You can, you can draw as much as you want from them and there's just more coming. And after a while, you go, man, you're incredible. What's going on in your life? They say, it's not me. It's the Lord. That's how we're supposed to live. God doesn't like self-sufficiency. A cistern goes dry when it gets hot for a prolonged period of time. So when life heats up, our time gets thin, and we dry up spiritually, that's a warning. If, if you've got so much going in business and school and home and work, and if you've got your personal life and everything's going all over the place, 
and you're just getting all dry spiritually, it means that you're not living a life drawing on the fountain of Christ. Instead, you've manufactured some kind of a collection device. Now, I don't know if you collect from the radio or you collect at church or you collect from tapes, but you kind of got this cistern going and you go and you go and you get enough and you try and make it through the week with your collection device. That's not the Christian life. Christian life is we don't have collection devices. We have a fountain welling up within us. And we have the Spirit of God bearing his fruit in our lives. And it doesn't matter if we're in the dungeon with the clay up under our armpits like Jeremiah was. We overflow with the power of God. Letter B, the self-life grows up in at least seven varieties. Number one is self-seeking. Self-seeking is a constant seeking of self-advancement and promotion. Isn't that what our society teaches us? You know, go for it. Get everything you deserve. Number two, there's self-righteousness. These are all sinful. Self-seeking is sinful. Self-righteousness is sinful. That's trusting in ourselves that we can do enough good and God will be pleased with it and we can make it. Don't worry about me. I'll, I'll get to heaven one way or another. Number three is self-dependence. People depend on themselves. Self-help. It's our constant tendency to rely on our own efforts rather than on Christ, as Galatians 2 and Zechariah 4 say. Number four is self-pleasing. And that's the resultant gratification indulgence that is perilous to our spiritual life. We just want to please ourselves. You know, and people measure whether they should get into a ministry by, well, I don't know if I like that. Like that? I mean, that's a self-pleasing statement. I, I, I want to pick things that, you know, and we live life looking for, you know, kind of like the most pleasing and, and, and indulgent things. And God doesn't, he says, just do what's right. Don't do what feels good, what, what pleases you. Do what's right. Number five, self-will. Self-will is at the center of all of our lives. It's the carnal, selfish will that needs absolute renunciation. We have to, we have to renounce that self-will that, that prompts so many of us. I mean, raise a few children, you'll see self-will. I mean, no one taught it to them. They just, uh, uh, my way. You know, before they even can talk. They just, I know none of your kids do that. Mine do. Self-will, they were born with it. Self-defense, that's the desire to vindicate and justify ourselves. I mean, how many of us spend all of our time going, well, that's not true, you didn't hear it right, I didn't do that, you know, we just go around. You know what God said, if you stop doing all that, I'll defend you. Wow, think about that. Self-glory, all those are self-weeds from our old flesh. Number four, another key verse is Jeremiah 2.32, God is seeking your attention. Write those words, three words, seeking your attention. Let me read you the verse. This is what it says. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people forget me days without number. A virgin will wear ornaments. Now that reminds me of the Bugalusa tribe. I've told you about them before, but they hang flat irons from their earlobes in Africa and they stretch their earlobes and they tie knots in them to show their marital status. One knot means single. Two knots means married. Three knots means too many flat irons. A bride would wear an outfit that would show she's married. A virgin would wear ornaments showing that she was available and that there was a dowry. And, and any woman that wanted to get married would wear her ornaments so they'd know she was a virgin. And all the women that were married would wear their attire. You know what God says? Just these people in their regular life wear the right clothes every day, but you don't even stop to think about me. God is seeking your attention. Number five, God is searching for tender, responsive, fruitful hearts I wrote those words in for you. It says here, Thus says the Lord, Break up your fallow ground. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. God wants us to have tender, responsive hearts. God is showing the pathway. Here's a key verse you ought to have underlined in your Bible. 616. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the way and seek and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Look at the next line. We, they said, we will not walk in it. Isn't that the attitude of our society? I'm not going to walk that way. That's ridiculous. God is looking to show us a pathway. God is specific in his plan, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. You know, if you want to go around and say anything great, say, I met with the God of the universe this morning. And he walks with me, and he talked with me, and he told me I'm his own, 
and he revealed himself to me in the word of God. Can't think of anything greater than that in the whole world. Number uh, eight, God is searching our hearts. Jeremiah 12, thou art near in their lips, but you're far in their mind. Thou art known, O Lord, thou seest me, thou examines my heart's attitudes. You know, we can come like this, you know, and just be all smiles in church. And we can be near in the lip and far in the heart. Isn't that an awful condition to be? And, you know, it doesn't make any difference to me whether, whether you're smiling or not. It matters whether or not God is near in your heart. God is searching. God is searching our hearts all the time. Number nine, God is sufficient for our needs. Jeremiah 15, 16. God is sufficient for our needs. Thy words were found, I ate them, and thy words became for me a joy and delight of my heart. You examine yourself. If there are depressions in your life, if there are slows of despond, if there are hard times, it's because you and I are not finding and eating the Word of God. We can watch TV, we can read the paper, we can be amused and entertained, but it's hard work to get in the Word, and we need that. Number 10, God is strengthening his own, Jeremiah 17. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. He'll be like a tree planted by the waters. By a stream, he will not fear when the heat comes. His leaves will be green. He won't be anxious in drought or cease to yield fruit. And finally, number 11, God is sharing his blessing. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. I want to close with this. One of my dear friends, he's a really, really old critter, really loves the Lord. I can't read Jeremiah 29:11 without mentioning Bill. Saintly fellow was riding along in his car when he was 10 years old, about 70 years ago. And he had nine brothers and sisters and his mom and dad, and they were all in a Model T. You know how small a Model T was? And his dad was driving, and there were five of them in the front seat, and somehow one of the kids' legs got all wrapped around in the pedals. And someone veered in front of him, and when the dad went to push the brake, his child's leg was underneath, and he crushed the leg, but he couldn't stop the car. And they hit head-on two cars on a Rhode Island road. My friend Bill tells me that they were coming home from Sunday school, and his memory verse was, I have plans for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And he had been working on his verse. He was part of the nine kids in the car. He was going, for I know the plans I have for you, Seth, the Lord plans for you. And just then the car veered and crashed and hit head on. And Bill said that the first thing he remembered was, he said he woke up, he was face down on the road, and he said it was just a warm puddle. And he lifted his face up and he looked. And he said he was laying in a big red puddle of blood. He says all of his family were laying just all, you know, twisted all over on the pavement and the other car too. And he said, with blood dripping down his face, he said his verse, For I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, to give you a future and a hope. Well, some of his family members didn't live. His mother didn't live. His father was crippled all his life. His brothers and sisters weren't too well. Bill wasn't well either. But, you know, he became one of the saintliest. He was an elder at Quidnesset Church. And he could not stand up and give a testimony without saying, I was the boy that was laying in the blood on the pavement. And he said, if you've ever been laying in the blood on the pavement, quote Jeremiah 29, 11, and know that God has a plan for you. Like I said at the beginning, you might not be as bad off as Jeremiah. You might not be laying in blood on pavement like Bill Callender was. But the same potter, the Heavenly Father potter, is poking into your life and my life tonight, and he wants us to faithfully respond to him. I can't respond for you. You can't respond for me. We each need to faithfully respond to our heavenly potter.